Hey, how's it going guys? This is my guide to buying scopes for air guns. I'm going to go over a few features that you need to look for in an air gun scope and a few of the things that you need to try to avoid. So anyway, here we go. Okay, now why each one is going to be a little bit different from scope to scope. Every scope is going to have some type of way to focus the eyepiece, whether it's the European type that threads really fast in and out, or the type like this that has a locking ring, so once you get it where you want it, you can lock it. But the function of the eyepiece is only to focus the crosshair. That's all it does. Now, there is one other thing that it'll do, we'll discuss a little later, but to start off with, this focuses the eyepiece Okay, moving it from the eyepiece is the tube of the scope. Now, the tube basically comes in two diameters, one inch and 30 millimeter. The 30 millimeter is, has a few advantages. One is, depending on how the internal part of the scope is set up, it can let in more light. Most likely what it gives you is more travel for the rectical assembly, which is inside here. So it allows the crosshair to go up and down, left and right, in a more drastic fashion. That way you get more travel. So if you're shooting extreme distances, you're able to elevate more without having to resort to using a drooper mount or some type of a signature ring or adjustable scope ring. Okay, crosshair choices. <laughs> this is a hard one also. Uh, most inexpensive scopes come with one of two things. They either come with a standard duplex, which is the heavier lines that go down into a thin line, or they'll come with some type of mill dot or a ballistic mill dot. That'll be reference points from the center of the crosshair going down. Often they'll go to the left and right and sometimes even go up. What these are for is for holding over, so you don't have to re-zero your scope. You can zero your scope at, say, 30 yards, and if you decide to shoot at something that's 55 yards, you can use those reference points to elevate. With a duplex scope, the only elevation mark you have is where it goes from the skinny to the, to the thick part, and there's no, no other way to do it. But those are kind of the two type that you see. Uh, I'll show you a picture here of a mill dot and a duplex and a couple other crosshairs. But there's a lot of more refined crosshairs for target shooting. I'm a, I personally like a floating target dot, but like I say, I mainly plink. Uh, I very rarely hunt with my air guns. So I mainly plink and I like the way a tiny dot is easier for me to visually center in the target. The other thing that all the scopes will have in common is this dial adjustment. The one on top moves the rectical assembly vertically up and down. The one on the side moves it left and right. As you can see it's numbered so it's easy to return to where you started. Now there basically are two different types. There's the target turret which this is and then there's the hunting type that include the cap. A lot of times the tactical and target scopes don't include the cap. I'm very lucky on this one that it does have the target turrets and it does include the cap. Some do, some don't. There's really not a drawback to the tactical scopes that don't have the caps because normally the, the clicks are so positive and so hard to turn that you're not going to turn it accidentally. Alright, here's a look at a set of target turrets for my weaver scope as you can see a cap's not going to go over these and you can also see the signature rings the burr signature rings have inserts in them that you can buy offset inserts to compensate if your scope is not hitting where you want it to using the insert you're able to keep your scope optically centered which gives you the very best focus picture it also gives you the most travel in every direction and it's just better for the scope it doesn't have everything inside here in a bind. The closest you can get the scope to optically center, the better it is. 
Now one of the real friend of air gunners are these type of base. These will allow you to use weaver rings, which are much more secure. They go in the slot. There's a total of four screws holding this base into that 11 millimeter groove instead of just two tiny rings holding it. And there are also three drop pins inside here that drop directly down onto the tube, which keeps it from moving. The other nice thing about this is this particular base is a drooper base. So it is thicker back here than it is up here. What that does is point the scope slightly down, which elevates your barrel. That compensates for barrel droop. It also gives you a lot more elevation if you want to shoot longer targets. So most spring powered guns can benefit from some type of a drooper mount, unless you're just going to shoot 10 yards indoors. But a lot of brake barrels need a drooper mount to even be able to achieve zero. Okay guys, focus is very easy to understand, obviously. As you can see right now, there's a nice clear picture out in my backyard. You can see my deck, you can see the fences, you can see the buildings behind it, and my target. Now what I'm about to do is focus on my hand at just a few feet away, and if you'll notice, the picture behind you starts getting fuzzy. Okay, see the difference? The iPad is focused on my hand now, so everything around it is a distorted and a little fuzzy. And on the front of the scope is the adjustable objective. What the adjustable objective does is it helps focus the target inside the scope, but mainly what it does is get rid of parallax. I'll show you in a minute what parallax actually means. It's really simple once it's broke down to you. And as you can see, this has markings on it. So if you know how far you're shooting, say 200 yards, you turn it to that setting and it should be parallax free and it should be very close to perfect focus. Now here's a look at an objective on a Weaver target scope. As you can see, this one goes all the way down to 50 feet. As you turn it up, there's 20 yards, 25, 30, and it'll go all the way up to infinity. The benefit of this type of scope is that it'll let you focus at a much closer distance. So if you're shooting inside your house, say in your basement at uh, 10 yards, if you're shooting 20 yards in your backyard, a lot of scopes don't focus down that closely. One of these will. Okay, parallax is honestly just as easy to understand. Let's pretend that this dot is what we're aiming at the center of that little ornament with. Now as you move your eye around, the dot appears to move. Because of that, your point of impact is going to shift. That's what's known as parallax. Okay, and this is parallax free because they're on the same focal plane. As you move your eye around, it doesn't matter. It stays centered in what you're wanting to shoot at. That's because now they're both on the same focal plane where before they weren't. Okay, now that I've showed you what parallax is and what focus obviously is, now you have to figure out how to get your scope parallax free with the target that you're shooting at and you also want your focus right. So here's the best way to do it. Get your gun in the bags, get it as still as you can possibly get it, turn your dial to the number that it indicates. Look through your scope and bob your head around like a chicken or some kind of weird lizard. If you see guys doing this at the range, that's what they're doing. They're making sure that their scope is parallax free. That's the only way to do it. You just move your head slightly. If you see a shift in the crosshair on the target, then they're not on the same focal plane. All you have to do is make the focal planes meet. In order to do that, just turn your objective till you get zero movement where the crosshair is locked on the target. Now, here's the tricky part. On inexpensive scopes, a lot of times to get it parallax free, it's not in its best focus. So what I do, I get it parallax free as very best I can at the distance that I'm wanting to shoot. Here after a while I'll be shooting 35 yards, so I'll set my scope for 35 yards and I'll get all the parallax out of it. Once I do, you can tweak your focus on the back just a little without changing the way the crosshair looks too much 
and you get this wheel, change the parallax just the tiniest bit, but very little, and you can normally get a good clear picture and you can get it parallax free without changing the way your crosshair looks. Okay, another way that scopes are broke down is in first focal plane and second focal plane. Second focal plane is what we're most familiar with here in the States. Uh, the military scopes, a lot of those are first focal plane. The second focal plane quite simply means as you turn the magnification up on the scope, the picture increases but the crosshair stays exactly the same. Uh, that can be really nice for precision shooting and that type of thing. It can also have a downside. The first focal plane scopes as the, the magnification is turned down to a lower power, the crosshair is actually very thin. As you turn the magnification up, the crosshair grows with the target. The advantage to that is, say you're out back and you're shooting at sparrows at 45 yards with your air gun, and you're having to come down a hash mark or two on your scope, but you realize you want more magnification. With a second focal plane, if you increase the magnification, you lose your reference points. They no longer line up. With a first focal plane, regardless of the magnification, the lines always line up. Once you have a good reference hash mark, you can turn the power up or down, stay on that hash mark, and it'll still hit. That's the big advantage to it. Me personally, I prefer the second focal plane because I'm more of a plinker, and once I turn the magnification up with the thin crosshair, I'm able to do a little more precise shooting. But that's just me. I don't use the first focal plane type scopes that much. I'm more of a click and dial type guy. Guys, there's one other thing I wanted to leave y'all with, and then I'm going to wrap this one up. In my personal experience, and just my personal opinion, some of the most overpriced, low-quality scopes on the market are targeted towards the air gunners. Shop carefully. Go online, look at reviews. Uh, be, be careful what you buy. If you buy a $70 scope and it blows up, it's only $70. On the other hand, I just soon not waste seventy dollars. So if you buy a scope that you have questions going into it, how it's going to hold up, keep the receipt, keep the box, keep all of the documentation. That way, if you do have to send it back, you've got some type of recourse. If you get in touch with one of these uh, scope companies and all you've got is a broken scope, you don't have any type of receipt. You can't tell them where it came from or anything else. You're pretty well SOL. But anyway. Guys, thanks for watching my videos. I truly appreciate it. Uh, like and subscribe. I've got more coming. Bella, thanks for watching, guys. That's right, honey. <laughs>